to uh, this afternoon uh, special event. Uh, we are being, uh, we have the pleasure to host uh, His Excellency uh, His, uh, Theodore Miletskanu, who's not only the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Romania, but I was reading his CV, and he's also an academic, so he's also uh, part of our community. He has, uh, 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 he has played multiple roles, both as a career diplomat, uh, he's been uh, a former head of intelligence, as for the CV, and, and, <laughs> and of course, he's a member of parliament representing the Prohova constituency in Romania. I had the pleasure of visiting your country last year, and I drove from, um, I drove to Sibiu and uh, Prasov and, and a few other places, and I was um, particularly impressed with the, both the level of excitement in your country to meet someone from India, and I saw that there was a great uh, 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 inquiry about India, its changes, its people, uh, its new role. Uh, and of course, uh, I was uh, delighted to enjoy your cuisine as well, which is extremely fantastic. Uh, the minister is going to speak to us on um, a very contemporary and important issue. Uh, it, this is both a Romanian debate, uh, a European debate, and then also a debate that implicates all of us sitting in Asia, uh, going global versus staying local, Romania's agenda as a connector between Europe and Asia. And I think this comes at a time uh, when uh, the European continent is perhaps uh, at interesting times. It is witnessing interesting debates. It's, it's uh, interesting different flavors of politics. Uh, I was uh, mentioning to uh, uh, Ambassador who had come to Arab this morning that Europe is fast replacing South Asia as the most politically interesting zone in the world with everything that is happening there, uh, we are now focusing on Europe's stability in South Asia as much as Europe used to focus on South Asian stability. So thank you very much, Your Excellency, for joining us. Uh, we are honored to host you. And uh, without further ado, let me invite you uh, to speak to this audience and to those who are watching us online. We are also transmitting this online. So let me welcome you to deliver the speech this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, your Excellency, Mr. Saran, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really very grateful for this invitation, which will permit me to say a few words. I have a prepared speech. I hope it will be short, but interesting. We'll see what, uh, how things will evolve. And I'm ready to answer any questions. Uh, I have a very clear vision. I always uh, believe that uh, I know more answers than the questions you can put to me, but uh, I, I will try to do my best in order to, re to respond to, to your um, uh, interest. Now, um, before I enter into the real substance of the ideas I want to share with you today, allow me a word on the title of my presentation. Our ambassador, has reminded me in preparing for the visit of the outstanding quality of research and debate at your institute. That's why I was naturally uh, decided to find something important and an interesting and attractive uh, title. That's why I used uh, this title um, about uh, going global versus staying local, and Romania's agenda as a connector between Europe and, and Asia. Because when supply is plenty, the details of the offer can make the difference. Thank you very much. And in all honesty, I must confess from the start, however, that we were uh, somewhat misleading uh, this title for Romania, this dilemma suggested in the title we have chosen is only a theoretical one, not a political one. No one with decision-making power seriously thinks in Romania that there is a choice to be made between concentrating on local dynamics and opening up to the wider world. From the central administration to local authorities, from cities and villages, elites, to the majority of the public, Romania and Romanians favor openness, integration, globalization, 
and the free flow of people, ideas, goods, services. It is also true that we are very fond of our cultural identity, history, and unique traditions, which makes Romania, all of them make Romania, an increasingly attractive tourist destination. This is for you. Uh, and um, we are confident that going global while preserving your specificity is possible. Please believe me. To be more nuanced uh, on this point, we do not see globalization as an unavoidable destination for all humanity, nor do we think this is the golden promise for lasting peace and prosperity. We see globalization as a sum of processes that decisively shape our world in all aspects of political, social, and private life. It unfolds with benefits, but also with costs. It shows different facets to different people, depending on various factors. And such differences are indeed important sometimes within the same geographic area. This is the fact that might explain why, for some, globalization seems to be beneficial, and for others, it is less than that. This built-in ambivalence, and double potentially, is reinforced by fast traveling information, and by the fact that differences among people or within societies are instantly exposed and widely known, feeding into heightened perceptions of inequality, unfairness, and quite often mistrust. From Romania's perspective, globalization has the tremendous potential of bringing more prosperity, development, and stability to each country, region, and even for the entire world, provided it is steered according to a number of key principles. These relate to openness, transparency, dialogue, free market, and fair competition, multilateralism, international law, the peaceful settlement of disputes, a serious commitment to achieve the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda of the United Nations, to name but a few. We do believe that the leadership in Asia and in Europe should focus on how to make such benefits and many other opportunities brought about by globalization more widely accessible to every citizen. At the same time, we need to strategically address the downsides. Increased interdependence means increased vulnerability including new tools for aggression, like cyber attacks, propaganda, and hostile foreign or outside influence. And also a growing sense of losing identity becoming, is becoming a very fertile ground for radicalization, particularly among youngsters. I was wondering, while flying over the Indian Ocean, how to capture, in a nutshell, what binds today the Republic of India with, with, uh, with its strategic location in the Indian Ocean to Romania, a European Union member state located near the Black Sea? The answer is simple. Irrespective of distance or geopolitical paradigms, connectivity, shared values, and foundness of each other's culture and spirituality. <coughs> a quick profile of Romania will clearly highlight a number of similarities between our countries. In 2018, we celebrate our centenary, 100 years of the modern Romania, bringing together in one most of the historic provinces where Romanians have been a majority. Establishing modern Romania was, it's true, the result of the First World War, of unprecedented sacrifices and visionary diplomatic negotiations 
in the peace processes after the war. 100 years, it's a unique opportunity for us to reflect on who we are, what we have become, and what can we bring to the next generations and to the world. It's a very simple resume. A former communist country that was stifled under a well-known dictatorship of the 20th century, Romania has emerged over the past decades as a widely recognized democracy, a market economy, a tolerant and open society with built-in legal provisions for protecting ethnic, religious, and cultural diversity. Transformations were profoundly and difficult, but at the historical scale, our people have never been more prosperous and safer than today. The performance of our economy gives us more reasons to be optimistic and to open up to new global relations. Since the year 2000, Romania's GDP has grown 3.5 times, while exports have increased six times from European Union and 11 times from our exports to the European Union. Between 2000 and 2008, the Romanian economy grew at an average of 5.8% every year, due to a large extent to the EU accession of my country and the related reforms, as well as to foreign investment and exports. After the difficult years of the financial crisis, growth resumed in 2018, accelerating at 4.8% in 2016 and at 7.1% in 2017, which is the highest in the EU 20 or 28 member states. We are expecting to maintain a solid positive trend according to EU growth scenarios. If it were to sum up the distinctive, distinctive features of our current international profile, I will say that we are a member of the European Union and NATO, located at the eastern borders, frontiers. We have a strategic partnership with the United States. We are permanently acting as good neighbors bilaterally and as a solid, principled actor multilaterally. We take our security very serious, and we have substantially increased investment in military capabilities, this year reaching the famous 2% of the GDP for our defense budget. Our military is present in numerous European Union and NATO missions. Romania ranks the fifth in the number of troops in Afghanistan the first in EU missions in Somalia and Georgia. As a middle-sized country for the European level, I'm not speaking about uh, India, Romania had multilateralism in its foreign policy DNA because multilateralism, multi, multilateralism it is in our national interest. We are very active within the United Nations system with a distinctive multilateral profile. These motivations, uh, this is practically one of the main motivation of our candidature for a non-permanent member of the Security Council in the period 2020-2021. And our candidature is based on solid principles and we are preparing to bring a strong contribution to the United Nations framework. In the same spirit of advancing global governance and effective economic multilateralism, we follow with great interest the large-scale multilateral and regional free trade deals being pursued. We are active supporters within the European Union, and I truly believe that in the benefits of all these agreements which are taking place uh, between the European Union and other countries, it will represent a very important benefit for all the nations. 
We believe that such agreements of free trade have huge potential to unlock economic growth with worldwide uh, implications. I will also mention that the aim of becoming a member of the OECD and hopefully the upcoming, I, we hope that in the upcoming months um, we will register some decisive steps in this direction since we have a convincing track record. For Central and Eastern Europe, the Central European Initiative or the new Bucharest 9 format focusing on security aspects in Southeast Europe and the Western Balkans, for instance, with the uh, CECP, the EU Danube strategy in the wider Black Sea region and in Central Asia as well. We will also practice mini lateralism to use another concept which adds more strength to our foreign policy via a whole array of trilateral or quadrilateral, more or less formal initiatives engaging our neighbors, like the ones with Poland and Turkey, with Greece and Bulgaria, with Bulgaria and Serbia and others. From this point of view, we will support the idea to relaunch the process of the negotiations, balanced, ambitious, and mutually beneficial agreements on track and investment between EU and India with a modern framework for investment protection. Our positive economic outlook, together with political stability and the geographic position, already provides a set of motives underlining why Romania is a significant regional player in Europe and the gateway between Asia and Europe. I have spoken extensively on our regional connectivity agenda on the east-west, north-south axis, but Romania is also investing more these days in trans-regional processes, particularly in ASEM and in the EU Asian cooperation platforms. We are committed to expanding the economic and connectivity agendas discussed within these two fora, and I hope that the future will bring clear deliverables here too. In 2019, from the 1st of January, Romania will hold the presidency of the Council of the European Union. Prospects are there for our countries to stimulate progress based on their expertise and own achievements. Connectivity should be the economic backbone of wider exchanges between Europe and Asia, be they in trade, services, data, technology, security, science, culture, and people's to people's contact. The foundations of the European Union were laid through the efforts of member states towards building a common single market, thus encouraging efficient network for the free flow of goods, services, and persons. We thus have the knowledge and the values worth sharing with our partners. Today, particular focus should be placed on energy and digital infrastructure in order to reach together with transportation routes the full potential of our connectivity pathway. Echoing the recently adopted Europe-Asia strategy for connectivity, we believe that promoting complementary initiatives would positively enforce the cohesion of the development of regional ties, especially in transport infrastructure. We should make better use of the natural avenues that can facilitate a rapid increase in the flow of people, goods, and services, and generate synergies with existing policies towards regions and partners with strategic importance for the European Union, such as states from the Eastern Partnership, Western Balkans, or Central Asia. For Romania, the Danube and the Black Sea are important connectivity waterways, and we look forward to fresh ideas on including them in the large cross-regional 
and Euro-Asian transport networks. In this respect, we are set to do much more. Our country is already at the juncture at the Black Sea between Northern Europe, Central Asia, Middle East, Eastern Mediterranean, and the Adriatic Sea. The potential for becoming a global hub for the building connectivity is huge. Our strategic objective is to place the Black Sea on a primary route of the new international trade corridors to increase the number of energy routes crossing Romania and the reversible interconnections with our neighbors to fully exploit offshore energy resources to become an even stronger energy exporter, to finalize several major European road infrastructure projects in order to connect Europe from east to west and with its immediate neighbors. In our connectivity and strategic infrastructure investment, Constanza is our biggest port to the Black Sea, is becoming one of the most promising harbors on the western shores of the Black Sea and eastern borders of the European Union. And more investment is planned to increase its attractiveness. Strategic cooperation between Constanza and important Asian ports can provide a suitable framework for developing its logistical potential by sea and by rail from Constanza <coughs> via the Danube, the largest waterway of Central and Eastern Europe, and we are also working on further connections with Rhine Main waterway corridor to Northern Europe. Interconnectivity shapes the world and transforms geography and politics at the same time. In parallel to working on connection on connecting Europe with Asia, we are acting in order to increase interconnectivity within Europe. And as an important regional endeavor in this regard, it's one initiative, uh, we, I can say a few words if you want, it's the so-called the Three Seas Initiatives. Countries from the Baltic Sea, Black Sea, and Adriatic Sea. The initiative, this initiative of the Three Seas is pro-economic development, pro-European, and pro-transatlantic, and it was designed to address the development gap between the newer and the older EU member states through increased interconnectivity in the fields of transport, energy, and digital market. Its focus makes it extremely relevant in a world where a connectivity has become a prerequisite for economic growth. A eight-year continuous GDP growth and the significant potential in the field of IT, including cybersecurity, naval and aeronautical industries, port infrastructure, banking, and other wide range services are competitive advantages that Romania is keen to benefit from in expanding its relations globally. This is not just a narrative, but a practical list of diverse cooperation opportunities with India, a country with which we share many things. Romania's economic dynamism and favorable business climate finds a suitable match in India's ever-growing economic strengths and opening to the world. We are aware of the economic and social policies of Prime Minister Modi aimed at expanding India's economic power through ambitious investment programs while stimulating employment and welfare of the people. We fully share this vision of an including economic and social development fueled by business dynamism. Moreover, India's international reputation in education and Romania's growing profile in the education and research and development fields should enlarge our bilateral perspectives. We are highly interested in effectively harnessing such possibilities. Consistent with our policy of deepening our engagement in the framework of Asia-Europe uh, meeting, in May 2019, we will be very proud to host its first, sever 
it first ever ASEM meeting at ministerial level, namely the seventh ASEM education ministers meeting, back to back with the seventh ASEM rectors conference and students forum. The topic of these meetings revolves around higher education, a subject both Romania and India attach great importance and an area in which there is potential for further interregional cooperation, but also, I am confident, at our bilateral level as well. In our view, ASEM needs to occupy a forefront place in the multilateral diplomacy strategy of each partner country, as well as in the economic and human connectivity policies. Now, concluding, I will say that getting back to the bigger picture encompassing both Europe and Asia, the very well-known and reputed Indian professor Parag Khanna, in his fabulous book on connectography, he buries the old uh, adage, geography is destiny, and makes the mind-resetting argument that connectivity is destiny. He also inspiringly claims that global infrastructure are morphing out our world systems from divisions to connections and from nations to nodes. With our historical experience in Europe and such a pivotal country between Central and Southeastern Europe, Central Asia and the Middle East, as well as the Eastern Mediterranean, ignoring geography would be a mistake. But fully rethinking, it is a must. Geography still counts in classical ways, determining political and economic trends. On the other hand, geography is for the first time in history not only a determining factor, but also a result. We can produce geography, and this is therefore what we, um, why I'm taking with all modesty uh, the attempt to rephrase Mr. Kana's insights about dying geography and rising connectivity by saying that geography is connectivity, and this will determine our destiny. Our world, it's a complex map of connections, a design of overlapping networks, both real and virtual. Academics and scientists cannot be mapped out and understand connectivity and networks. Leaders, and especially foreign ministers, cannot but work with connectivity and networks in order to multiply them, make them work for better national prosperity and security, better interstate relations, and enhanced economic opportunities arising from international interaction. Defense ministers and interior ministers cannot but manage and protect connectivity and networks not to be misused against the security interests of our countries and of our citizens. At the end, my message to India is a very simple one. We share more things than we commonly know, and there are important principles and priorities for shaping the future of our region and multiplying bridges between them. We should articulate new politics and economic energies in knowing each other better, in working together to turn opportunities into projects and results for our countries and for our peoples. By doing that, we will also add our joint contribution to making globalization work better for Europe and for Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, very broad speech. I think you were able to cover some of the crucial uh, issues that um, implicate uh, all of us today. Uh, you spoke about uh, energy and its um, and Romania being an energy hub. You spoke about uh, the essence and importance of connectivity and Romania again being well placed to play that role of being a of being a hub for connecting regions and, and uh, different geographies, and you spoke about uh, the digital 
that uh, sector as being extremely important to connect us through knowledge and through innovation and how Romania sees that as a great potential uh, in its new role. Um, before we uh, turn to the audience which is gathered here and I'm sure many of them will have questions for you, I'm taking the prerogative of the chair and posing a few before the opening up. So uh, so I want, the first question I really want to ask you is um, on uh, the relationship with the EU. Um, even as we see a different kind of conversation happening in Brussels today which says we have to do more, we need to invest in security, we need to become more political, we need uh, to fend for ourselves due to what's happening across the Atlantic. Um, the debates in Romania themselves, um, and um, this, import this question is important because most of what we know about Romania comes from Western press. So I think your first-hand response is useful. It is suggested that some of the Romanian debates at home, developments at home, are not necessarily speeding up the process of integration with, with uh, into the Schengen and into a closer partnership with Brussels. Um, what are your views on this reportage that we sometimes hear sitting in New Delhi, that Romania and its internal political dynamics are making it difficult for closer integration and perhaps even a place in the Schengen zone uh, at early date. Yes, thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, should, I, yeah, please. should I take the yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. So you want to no, no, I, I'll ask okay. you a few more before we move to the Okay, okay fine. Yeah. But I think, I think this, is a, this is the first question. Okay. The second is that we uh, also see in EU uh, new actors beginning to, in Europe, new actors beginning to have an impact. Uh, you mentioned European-Asian partnership. I think uh, the equation may have changed. Asia is now in Europe. China is an active actor in, in your part of the world. So how, are, how is Chinese investments, uh, Chinese um, business interests, Chinese political interests changing the dynamics of the continent? And I think uh, uh, certainly uh, we again read about this uh, sitting in New Delhi from Western sources and again a Romanian perspective on the role of China in the evolving uh, uh, political situation would be useful. And finally, uh, Russia, uh, you mentioned about your strategic relationship with the US. And um, uh, I think that's something which all of us are aware of, that the EU, that the Romanian-US relationship uh, has legs of its own. It is beyond the European-American relationship. It, is, it, is, it has its own texture. Um, in this situation, what is the role for Romania? As we see uh, uh, Russia surprise us with its political actions, um, or rather, as we see Russia doing what it believes is its sovereign um, uh, uh, right and, and, and responsibility, what is the role for Romania in this situation? Does it have a, a role to play in bridging the distance? Uh, is it uh, becoming itself uh, a party to the, to the tensions? So uh, does it have a moderation role or is Romania too firmly embedded to, take, to play that role anymore? Uh, these are the three questions for you, and then we'll open, uh, open it up for this. Go ahead. OK. Thank you very much. Now, uh, what I wanted to say in answer to, to your first question is the problem of the evolution of the European Union. What will happen uh, uh, next year on the 9th of May in the uh, unofficial summit of heads of states and governments, which will take place in the city of Sibiu, the main discussion will be about the future of the European Union. And in fact, yes, we need to look into the future and to see what could we do in order to make the European Union uh, more performant. From this point of view, we have two main problems. One is the departure of Great Britain from the European Union. It's a departure which we want to be very orderly, there are some hopes that things will evolve in the right direction. But one of the, let's say, um, one of the most difficult questions for us is the fact that the departure of Great Britain from the European Union is reducing the budget of the European U Union with 14% of its uh, contribution. It's a very important contribution for the budget of the European Union. This is the first thing we have to address. Secondly, the European Union is now 
obliged to find some solutions between their, let's say, classical policies of convergence between the countries, the common agricultural policy, and other uh, such uh, politics, and face the problems which are connected with illegal migration, and also the funding, the financing, the necessary funding of a policy of security and, uh, uh, and defense of the European Union as such. What we have to do in the period to come is to find a middle of the road solution to continue with the classical policies of the European Union, which are essential for countries like uh, Romania and other countries from the Central and Eastern Europe, and at the same time, to find the means in order to finance the new policies on migration and the policies concerning defense and security at the level of the European Union. What we are trying to do as the president, uh, in, uh, the president of the Council for the six months, for the next six months, it will be a very difficult task. To what we can do as president is to facilitate consensus to try to be an honest broker between different members of the European Union and to try to find the solutions to all these, uh, to all these uh, problems. From this uh, point of view, of course, there are differences in the positions of uh, member states of the European Union. But what we have to do is really to continue our preoccupations for making European Union more uh, solidary and uh, finding solutions from a financial point of view for our problems. There are another two issues in which we have to find some solutions. It's the relationship between the European Union and United States. From the economic point of view, as you know, President Trump decided to raise the custom duties uh, for some products uh, exported uh, from the European Union to the United States. The three most important chapters are the uh, steel, aluminum, and automotives. These are real important problems and issues which are touching Romania as well. To give you an example, uh, one of the biggest companies producing steel and exporting it to the United States is a company called Mittal. It's, uh, it was called Mittal, now it's Gupta. It doesn't matter, but it's one of the important companies which is practically uh, using uh, more than 10,000 uh, workers and a very important contribution also to the budget of the, of the state. This is one problem. Now, the, the second problem we have in our relations with the uh, United States it's the problem of the JCPOA agreement or nuclear agreement uh, yeah. of, uh, of Iran, where we also have different positions, the European Union and the United States. From our point of view, for the economic issues, there was a very important meeting between the president of the commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, and President Trump, and the decision was adopted to start some negotiations about how to arrange the problems of the custom duties between uh, the European Union and the United States. We are looking forward to the results uh, in, in, in the future, and we hope both parties will try to find a solution. Because finally, whatever you say, the natural ally of the United States is the European Union. Now, uh, the second issue, the issue of the nuclear agreement with, uh, with Iran, is also one point of, uh, of difference uh, between um, the European Union. Mainly, it's the three, even four countries. I'm speaking about Great Britain, France, and Germany, to which it, Italy is added in a certain form. And they would like to continue the functioning of the JCPOA in the, in, in the future. It's also true, we have to recognize very honestly, that from the political point of view, United States have some reasons. Besides the nuclear agreement, there are two issues very important for the United States and for all of us. It's the problem of the ballistic uh, program of, uh, of Iran. And secondly, the involvement of Iran politically in the region in which uh, they are living. 
from a practical point of view, the key issue for continuing the relation with Iran, which from our point of view, it's a positive development. It's not good to push Iran outside and to determine certain reactions, which could be very negative from the point of view of the, of the security. The most important issue is how to find a system of transfer of finances between the European Union uh, countries and, uh, and Iran. We have launched, uh, we are discussing at the level of the European Union about a mechanism which could be created provisionally in order to cover this, uh, this problem. We hope there will be some, some results in, in the future. You were speaking about Schengen. From a practical point of view, Romania has um, uh, spent a lot of money in order to secure the external border of our country and also the external border of the European uh, Union as a whole. From a technical point of view, Romania has the best system today, the most modern, because we built it uh, with, comp with a company composed of uh, French companies and German companies, and of course, uh, the evolution of the technology makes us to be on the first uh, on the first place. At the same time, due to the migration, the appetite uh, for uh, developing the the Schengen area is becoming uh, more and more difficult. As you know, already some countries, members of the Schengen Agreement, started to begin their control at the borders. And uh, one of the key issues here is the problem of the Dublin arrangement. Mm -hmm. I mean, the rules which permit the migrants to be returned to the first country in which they, they entered. Both these issues are representing important, uh, important uh, discussions and debates in the, in the European Union. Uh, from this point of view, uh, there is a very friendly invitation on behalf of um, of the French president to involve ourselves in the negotiations for a new Schengen refurbished uh, and also for um, um, modifying the Dublin agreement. And we hope our participation there will represent a positive contribution and we will arrive at uh, the point at which uh, we can uh, really become full members of Schengen, even if from, I repeat, from the technical point of view, but also from the point of view of exchanging information, we are connected to, to, the, to the same uh, system. Now, the, uh, the China, the main idea was China about, about China, two words. Um, from our point of view, for the countries from Central and Eastern Europe, China has created a special mechanism, which is called 16 plus 1, which is organizing uh, a lot of meetings, uh, not once a year, but um, two or three times per year, in order to come with uh, concrete projects of interconnectivity and the development in our region. It's also true that for the time being, we are at the beginning of, of the process, there are a lot of uh, promises, openings. We'll have to see how many real projects will be put into, into practice. From what we see, the main preoccupation of China is to renew the so-called um, Silk Road on the land and on the seas in order to ensure their connectivity with Europe and other markets as you know, China is one of the countries which is manufacturing uh, a lot of goods. And of course, for them, this connectivity is an essential uh, issue. We hope very much that uh, at a certain moment, we'll arrive at, a, at an open discussion between um, the United States and China in order to see what could be done in order to keep open this uh, Silk Road, which will permit China to be connected with the rest of, of Europe. Now for Russia. Russia is it's, it's, it's a real problem. Uh, uh, Russia is, uh, in principle, a continental uh, power. It's not uh, like United Kingdom and others. Of course, they have a very important navy uh, playing an important role, OK. But at the same time, their preoccupation is always about their neighbors on the land. 
And from this point of view, of course, the extension of NATO and the European Union created at the level of the Russian Federation a preoccupation for what will be the follow-up, what will happen in the future. Uh, they have chosen for the time being to increase their capabilities, military capabilities, to, uh, to deter any, any enlargement. From our point of view, from the point of view of Romania, I'm speaking as the foreign minister of Romania, I believe that every country is entitled to make their own choices. They are free to decide where is, what's the best position for them, which is uh, good uh, or, uh, or bad. From this point of view, there is a policy agreed at the level of NATO and of the European Union in our relations with the Russian Federation, which is consisting of two elements, deterrence and dialogue. This deterrence and the dialogue are accompanied by economic sanctions uh, against Russia. What we need now is to try to have a normal deterrence in order to preclude or to forbid some um, uh, military um, operations and adventures. <laughs> and secondly, the dialogue, to have more dialogue, to have a direct dialogue uh, between uh, the peoples to peoples, uh, culture, uh, school, education, uh, and others. And I'm convinced that uh, the moment there will be some positive developments on, on behalf of, of Russia, the European Union will be ready to discuss also about the, uh, the, the economic uh, sanctions. There is another issue which I will uh, main, I'll mention in, in passing. Uh, there is also a problem of a di direct dialogue between the United States and, and, and Russia. And from this point of view, this dialogue could arrive maybe at some solutions from what we know. There are a lot of consultations, not at the level, not at the highest level, but there are a lot of consultations uh, at the level of experts, and they are working uh, on it. And I think it is something extremely uh, um, needed. Why? If you have uh, read or seen the news uh, yesterday, there was a military incident in the Black Sea between the uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, ships and uh, the Russian fleet, uh, of, of course. And from our point of view, we should start to work very clearly on measures of building confidence between us and preventing accidents of this type. Why? Because at a certain moment, such an incident could, could develop and create a lot of problems in, in the region. Unfortunately, the build-up, the military build-up in the in the Black Sea is, is quite, uh, quite uh, okay, I'll use again, important. It's too much, uh, really. Uh, but, uh, of course, it's not something different. You have it in the South China Sea. I mean, it's, uh, it's a policy which exists, uh, which is happening everywhere. That's why we are counting very much on, on a dialogue which will permit us at the European level to arrive at certain understandings, a direct dialogue between the United States and, um, and the Russian Federation, and in this case uh, uh, to arrive at a kind of um, consensus for them uh, in, uh, in ensuring peace and security. For the time being, uh, the things are, not, uh, things are not very encouraging. But uh, I think everyone should, uh, should do his best in order to find some, some solutions. Um, at the level, of when, I sp when I'm speaking about the Romania, we are trying to have a, a dialogue, a political uh, dialogue, uh, at a medium level with the Russian Federation. Our uh, colleagues, director generals and others uh, are meeting from time to time. We are mainly discussing about peace, security, about uh, non-proliferation of nuclear weapons and others. We want to extend this uh, kind of dialogue. And we hope very much that um, uh, the Russians will uh, answer positively. One of the big issues in, in their relations with Romania is a very simple one. We have on our territory a facility which is called Edges Ashore. Mm -hmm. 
And of course, uh, for the Russians, it is considered as a kind of danger. From our point of view, it's strictly a defensive uh, system which will permit us to be at, uh, at, at a point at which we, we should not be too frightened about what will happen. But the dialogue from our point of view is, uh, is important. We'd like to, to continue it. <coughs> Unfortunately, during the last uh, months, there were a lot of problems. Uh, Skripal case, uh, mm -hmm. spies and others, which delayed a little bit and postponed the, the, the dialogue. But we'll continue to, to work on it. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Um, I can now open it up to those who want to ask a question. Yes, introduce yourself and pose the question. Good evening, sir. Uh, I am uh, a consultant from PPNR division from Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, my question, there were two or three questions that I had, but I'll just pose one, which is the most immediate one uh, at the moment. Um, because right now we are going to have uh, the UN-led uh, global compact on uh, agreement on uh, migration. So there have been a lot of speculations as to Romania's stance on it because Austria has backed out of it and so has Czech Republic. And uh, as you had mentioned that you up, Romania upholds uh, international law at its utmost. And uh, just last week, uh, European Court of Justice passed a judgment against Austria saying that they have to treat the refugees and give them the same status as uh, the citizens. So what is uh, Romania's stand now on migration? Yes, yes. I, I... Spot? Yes. OK, fine. Thank you very much. I want to tell you that um, this compact of, on, on migration was an initiative uh, under the presidency of the United Nations General Assembly by the foreign minister of Slovakia, Mr. Lajčák. And um, uh, from our point of view, it's an important step forward. It's not a legally binding instrument when we speak about the Compact on Migration. It's a set of recommendations about treating, adopting policies, uh, encouraging, uh, creating support for them, and so on and so forth. At this moment, we are preparing an analysis at the level of the Foreign Ministry of Romania on this issue. There will be a meeting in Marrakesh, and uh, the moment we'll have a decision at the level of the President, Parliament, and of the Prime Minister, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll come it with our position in, in public. My, my feeling is that uh, from the point of view of our position as the President of the European Union, we have to follow the majority of the European Union members. It will be one of the elements in our judgment. And secondly, as we are a candidate for a non-permanent uh, seat uh, in the Security Council, it's obvious that we have to demonstrate that we are ready to work with all the countries, members of the European, of the uh, United Nations, in order to find the, the best solution. It's true that at the local level in different countries, it's not only Austria, it's Poland, it's uh, the Czech Republic and others, there is a rejection of, uh, of this idea of signing the, the global compact on migration. Uh, in Romania, we have some, um, uh, some uh, let's protests. say protests. Um, it's mainly on the on the Facebook. I mean, it's on on digital media. It's not something uh, in the street. Okay, but at the same time, uh, my impression is the, is that the majority of the Romanians are thinking about the need of solidarity when we speak about uh, issues like uh, migration. Uh, we are, not, uh, uh, we are not encouraging uh, the decisions uh, to have obligatory quota or things like that of redistribution, redistribution and so on and so forth. But I think solidarity is one of our obligations as members of the European Union and of the, of the United uh, Nations uh, General Assembly. That's why I'm optimistic about uh, the position we'll adopt uh, in, in Marrakesh. Thank you. Can I add? Yes, please. Because uh, Bulgaria has refused to sign, 
uh, the agreement. Uh, will uh, Romania also... Uh, He's already told you his specific differences as being the EU president and seeking a position in the UN Security Council. So I think asking the same question will not change his answer. No, 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 no. <laughs> with, with, with Even a different case study because Bulgaria is neither a, going to be EU presidency nor applying for the uh, yes, non-permanent member. So yes. I think he has answered that question. Uh, can I, Britta, you want to ask something? Yeah, sure, yeah. come in. I'm Britta Peterson, I'm a senior fellow here at the ORF. And, um, you already mentioned uh, uh, migration and uh, uh, some issues there um, in, in Eastern Europe, but the problem between the EU and some Eastern European states, namely Poland and Hungary, are, are not mainly about migration, and it seems that um, you talked a lot about the benefits that your country has received from, from the membership in the European Union, but apparently things went wrong in some other countries. And uh, my question is actually, what is it that went wrong and what would be your suggestion to bring back a sense of unity that was probably there for, for 20 years, but that is not there anymore and that is uh, actually um, jeopardizing uh, uh, the future of the EU? Uh, uh, Mr. Foreign Minister, to be <clears throat> a little provocative, just to add a little line. Uh, are you beginning to see a degree of fatigue in your own country with the experiment of the EU in a sense of aligning your own politics with that which is demanded from, say, the Western European um, uh, actors? Uh, are you seeing a certain uh, re resentment on the street uh, from certain classes and certain sections which say that why should we be uh, uh, absorbing all the ideology that flows from the west to the center or the east. I, I think that's a fair question because uh, we see in Hungary and in Poland a rejection of the political ideology on which the union was based. What can I say? Our countries, all the countries, members of the European Union are democratic countries. And in democracy, once every four or five years, you have elections. Now, uh, during the campaign, and uh, taking into account the results of the, of, the, of the election process, it's obvious that from time to time you have different majorities which have an, a different opinion about uh, some issues, including these uh, issues like uh, migration and, and, and others. Uh, it's not something, from our point of view, is not something uh, special. It happens uh, all the time. Uh, but what I'm convinced of is that uh, the, this, the desire to continue the process of the European Union integration and creating a strong Europe based on European values uh, which are adopted by all of us uh, we'll, uh, we'll pass through different periods, episodes uh, in, uh, in our history. But if you look at all the positions adopted by some countries, even if they are contesting some of the decisions or some of the conclusions uh, adopted by the majority, they never made any reference to the idea of leaving the European Union or renouncing to some of the values of the, of the European Union. What we have to do is to understand that sometimes uh, we cannot arrive uh, at an agreement immediately. But the, the desire and the mechanisms of the European Union will also find solutions for this. Now, for the problems concerning migration and, in general, the problems concerning justice and internal affairs, it's not a part of the single market. And that's why some of the countries mm -hmm. are trying to have their own nuances in, in applying it. It does not mean that they are against the, the European Union. On the contrary, what we have to do is to try to convince them and involve them in the process of finding solutions which are generally acceptable. That's why we decided to, to invite all, I mean, uh, all the heads of states and governments to Sibiu to discuss about the future of the European Union. And one of the issues of the kind you have raised will be on the agenda of the of this summit in, uh, in Sibiu. Thank you. Michel, you want to ask something? Okay. 
Uh, I saw, um, yeah, please. Uh, Your Excellency, my name is Kunal Dutt. I'm from the PTI. Uh, I have, uh, in your remarks, you mentioned that you want the exit of Britain from the European Union to be orderly. Uh, I would like to know what are the immediate implications that you, as as the next head of the Council of uh, European Union, feel that is going to have on the European Union? And overall, what essentially do you mean by the orderly exit, if you could elaborate, sir? Thank you. Uh, the, the, I mean, his question is that what is the orderly exit? Uh, I said, I, I said about the orderly exit, but I would like to add a few a few words about uh, about this. We'll have a lot of challenges during our uh, presidency. One is Brexit. A second one uh, is represented by the elections for the European Parliament, which will take place during the month of May. Now, in the period which is preceding the elections, um, all the candidates are entering into a kind of um, campaign pre-campaign and campaign afterwards. And sometimes you, you see a radicalization of the positions in order to get some electoral support uh, in a way or another. What we wanted to, what is our position, of course, we'll try to, to facilitate a consensus on this issue. Our, we are attaching a lot of importance to the Great Britain. From our point of view, they are a very important economic partner of Romania. And our vision is that even after the departure of the European Union, we will support the idea that we have to keep Great Britain as closely as possible to the European Union for at least two issues. One is, uh, of course, trade and development of our relations. A second one is the protection of the European citizens which are working in, in Great Britain. And the third one is for their contribution to the peace and security of, of Europe. They are one of the important pillars of this, uh, of the security of Europe. That's why we are, uh, we are very pleased that a political declaration was adopted concerning the future relationship between the Great Britain and the European Union. <coughs> and we, we are convinced that on the occasion of uh, our meetings uh, in uh, during our presidency, we'll start agree on some basic uh, issues about the relationship between the Great Britain and uh, the European Union. As I said, we'd like to be it as closely as possible, but it will depend on the general, um, the general approach of the rest of the Union, uh, European Union members. So, but like my first question, what is the immediate implication that you see uh, from the exit, sir? The immediate implications of the departure? I already told you, 14% less in the budget of the European Union. It's, it's, uh, and it's, bad. The, it's bad. It's uh, bad. I, I think it's, what it's he said was for the Central and Eastern European countries, that has a significance because there is a, a support mechanism that uh, aids in their growth and development, which will uh, certainly take a hit. And when, secondly, they are lacking, they will be absent from the new uh, general strategy of uh, defense and foreign affairs of the European Union. The <laughs> United Kingdom is playing an important role from this point of view. These two. Kabir. Uh, thank you, Excellency, for your comments. Um, uh, for my question, I'm going to change. Kabir works change. on the Middle East and mm. observer yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to change the geography a little bit uh, <laughs> as far as the questions goes. Um, yeah, you know, in, in 15, 16, we saw a lot of migration coming from Syria into Europe, which became a very both political and geographical challenge for many countries in the region. Uh, how does Romania, as, a, as, you know, uh, as, part of, uh, uh, as a significant part of Europe, uh, see uh, uh, the Syrian crisis in 2018? Specifically on the on, on the issue of migration coming and of migration of refugees coming from uh, from this uh, from the Syrian civil war, and just what is your general sort of perspective uh, on on the st on the security situation in the Middle East uh, today? Yes, thank you very much. Now concerning the Syrian uh, refugees. There are a few instruments which are used by the European Union in order to calm the migration to Romania. There is a so-called Turkish facility which was adopted by the European Union. We are all contributing with money to Turkey, uh, something like, I think, 4 billion of euros. Yes. Something like 4 billion of, years, uh, of, of uh, euros per, uh, per year. 
and they are keeping, they are organizing some uh, camps for refugees in Turkey instead of letting them get out. This is one measure adopted by the European Union. We are contributing ourselves to, to this facility for, for Turkey. Secondly, we are all the time insisting on the fact that the, Euro that the European Union should play a much more important role in finding a political solution to, to Syria. Because what is pressing, what is creating the migration of the Syrians outside of their country is the fact that there is an armed conflict in, in Syria. Uh, and this is creating, of course, uh, uh, the, the, the desire to, to, to get out. We will insist and will continue to insist on a more important involvement of the European Union in finding a political solution in the conflict in Syria. The third one, it's the third measure of the European Union, is to create a special fund for the reconstruction of, of Syria. Even if, the, even if a political solution will be accepted very soon, the Syrians who practically are refugees uh, in, in Europe, they, the majority of them, I'm sure, they will like to, to come back to their houses. But they have no houses due to the war. There is no electricity, no water, no medical care. It's a destroyed country in, in different regions to, to a very great extent. And all our, all our preoccupations are really to try to support a political solution to, uh, to this. From our point of view, it should be a, a Syrian solution uh, by negotiations between the government, uh, President Assad, and uh, different movements against uh, Assad. This is, the, uh, this is one issue. And the second one, we don't believe in, in processes of Astana and other meetings with Russians and Turks uh, trying to find some, uh, some solutions, military solutions. We really insist for the idea of, of having an international conference under the edges of the United Nations with the participation of, the, or of all those involved in order to arrive at a political uh, settlement of, uh, of this dispute. We are hoping, we are praying, and we are also pressing all our colleagues from the European Union to, to be more involved in finding this uh, solution and in supporting a post-reconstruction plan for Syria. Thank you. Anyone else have questions? Yes. Excellency, you have spoken very, given a very enlightenment talk. Uh, I would like to know your comments on the international terrorism. Is missing in your speech. And secondly, what do you think about state terrorism sponsored by states? And my second question is, uh, climate change, the role of one particular big nation from the agreement, impact the role of Romania. Thirdly, how you review the relationship between India and Pakistan or a regional, uh, for regional peace? To talk about Syria, but the most important Arab cause is left, resolution of the issue of Palestine. So these are certain areas. What is the role which Romania has its view or plans to see its resolution? Okay. Your Excellency, you must realize that you can't have a foreign policy conversation in India without having Pakistan invoked. Okay. Uh, the day we are able to do that, <laughs> I will throw a special dinner on, on that occasion. Uh, but go ahead, please. Okay. Um, international terrorism is one of the plagues of, uh, of our society. Uh, from our point of view, we have to do two things separately. We have to adopt measures which will restrain uh, and reduce the number of the acts of terrorism, especially the financing of terrorism in, in different countries. And secondly, we strongly believe that we have to do our best in order to create conditions which will not encourage terrorism. From this point of view, uh, different um, disputes and, uh, and the battles and the different companies, uh, different uh, structures are trying to use it. We are, what we see as the priority 
is to look at the roots of the terrorism. What's creating terrorism? The financial issues, the, uh, the um, religious issues, whatever. We have to address the root causes of the terrorism. But in the meantime, what we have to do is to adopt a, a, a general, let's say, um, agreement on fighting terrorism. There is, it's an Indian proposal at the United Nations, uh, and we are strongly supporting it. And we also have an initiative, Romania as a country, together with Spain, to create a special international court for terrorism, because sometimes it's very difficult to know uh, which country is responsible for, uh, for, for doing something or, or not. State terrorism, it's very difficult to demonstrate. What is happening uh, is not the terrorism, but it's the involvement in, in, the, in the cyber, in the digital field. Here, sometimes we have certain indications that the state the state is financing the, these acts of, uh, of this kind. The climate change, it's, it's a very difficult issue because you cannot do it without the United States, without other countries. We cannot, um, we cannot find measures to improve the deterioration of the climate change if all countries do not agree and they do not follow the policy. We have a Paris Convention from this point of view. Uh, the United States have withdrawn from, from this convention. And what we can do is to put pressure on all countries to start and work seriously. It's, not, it's affecting our countries, but please think about insular states, very small islands, what is happening with the climate changes. They can uh, simply disappear at a moment or another. That's why, as I said, it's an issue which is, has to be treated at the global level. And here, the United Nations and different organizations, including the European Union, should be much more active in finding solutions and coming with, with concrete proposals. We'll, we'll continue to support them. India and Pakistan, you are neighbors, you know. You are like the brothers. You don't choose your friends. Uh, your brothers uh, are here. I mean, your brothers, you are living in the same part of, uh, of the world. And of course, this, uh, this issue is extremely important for India and for Pakistan as well. I also believe that Pakistan can play a very important role in finding a solution for Afghanistan. Uh, that's why I, I believe uh, you have to, to demonstrate a lot of goodwill and possibilities to find the dialogue with, uh, with the Pakistani authorities. It's, it's a pity both countries um, have a, a very serious level of knowledge in all the fields, including in the nuclear field. And that's why I think it's, it's a must to, to, to try to find the solution and the kind of dialogue with, uh, with them from all the points of view. Now, concerning the Middle East, uh, Romania is of the, uh, we are strongly supporting the opinion that the only solution for the Palestinian crisis is the creation of two independent states living in peace and security in that region. From this point of view, of course, one of the very difficult issues is the issue of Jerusalem, which is representing, uh, it, it has an image which is fantastic in the Arab world, in the Christian world, in the Hebraic world, everywhere. That's why we believe that uh, after finding a solution between themselves, the idea of creating the two states, if it is accepted, I think the last stage of the negotiation should be the statute of Jerusalem. But it is to be negotiated between the Israel, Israel and, the, and the Palestinians. For the rest, what we can do is to try to encourage again to, uh, to, to, to have direct negotiations. And the European Union, I can assure you, is one of the structures which is very involved in finding a solution and pushing it. From our point of view as a country, we are, there are no countries in the world so involved, so interested in finding a solution to this conflict than Romania. 10% of the population of the state of Israel is composed of uh, persons who left Romania or their descendants. 10%, it's a lot. Secondly, during the communist regime, we have 10 
tens of thousands of uh, scholarships for Palestinians who became doctors, engineers, specialists in different fields. Some of them married, remained in Romania. Some of them, the majority of them, are going back to, to Palestine. That's why, for us, our interest <coughs> is to arrive at a peace settlement between the two, because we are very much connected both with Israel and with, uh, with uh, Palestine. And um, uh, last but not least, uh, as I said, the European Union is strongly supporting this process, which is called the peace process for, uh, for, for the Middle East and will continue to support this, uh, this process. For, the, for our relations with Palestine, with Israel, they are very good. With Palestine, we'll have the Joint Economic Committee uh, during the month of December with them. We are trying to help them with whatever we can. We are participating and contributing to the UNRWA Fund uh, of the United Nations. We'll try to find some possibilities to, to support them in our economic exchanges and encourage them also to look into the possibility of uh, starting a direct negotiation with, uh, with Israel. Unfortunately, as you know, uh, a part of the territory in Gaza is not under the control of Ramallah, which is creating more problems than, uh, than usual. But uh, our, our basic idea is to push to direct negotiations between Israel and Palestine. Before we conclude, sir, let me uh, ask you one last question. I think you touched on it um, in your res response to the gentleman on, on terror. Uh, but I think it is something that is um, affecting all of us across the world. Uh, it is sometimes called influence operations. It is sometimes called uh, psyops. It is sometimes uh, uh, the use of internet to spread propaganda and and false news, uh, democracies all over the world are struggling uh, to find policy and political responses to the ability of uh, the mischievous actors to use the digital medium. I was uh, informed about a study that was done in Romania a couple of years ago by my uh, alumni uh, from our fellowship program, a lady by the name of Oana Popescu. Yeah. Uh, she's a very dear friend and, a, and so someone who has been in one of our programs. And she was mentioning a study to me uh, where they have documented the use of propaganda uh, uh, within the Romanian state. Uh, being a democracy, and since we are a democracy heading to elections in six months' time, uh, do you have any uh, lessons to be shared for, uh, you know, with us on how do we respond to the use of the internet to, to, to protect and defend the institution of elections and democracy? I, I would be delighted to have such a solution. I, I, I received the Nobel Prize uh, for sure. What I can say is it's true. Uh, terrorism is also using fake news uh, and uh, other, uh, other systems, uh, uh, sometimes uh, very, let's say, dirty acts. Uh, we have a few Romanians, at least one Romanian, practically two, we don't know very well, who are prisoners of different movements uh, in, uh, in uh, Africa, in Mali, Burkina Faso, and also in Libya. It's for the first time that we are directly hit by, uh, by, what, by, by this kind of operations. Not what we can do, I mean, what I do recommend, it's not my idea, it's practically the policy of European Union and NATO, is to put the accent on two things, including resilience of the countries, and secondly, uh, having a special system structure for strategic communication. Strategic communication should combat uh, the fake news, and the resilience should increase the capabilities of the country to stay together when they are threatened by terrorist uh, acts. With these ex two exceptions, I. I I have no other solutions. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm really very sorry, but that is part of life. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, I think um, uh, this is a good note to uh, conclude this. Uh, oh, sorry. You wanted to ask. I didn't see you. Uh, globalization is shrinking very fast. Trump says America first. UK is coming out of European Union, 
so and trade war with fierce trade war between china and america is taking place and so is not on that scale with european union and china second so once you come out of european union comes out of the brexit your 40% budget will go so it will affect your financial health of the european union after the brexit agreement is finalized soon how it is going to affect your financial health was vis-a-vis -vis with china and united states one my second question is china is expanding its fleet in asia as well as in europe and trying to dominate the sea routes sea trade routes it is affecting started affecting asian countries including india how you see in future it will affect the european union and my third question is since the european union is coming out of the brexit europe is coming closer to asia including india thank you thank you thank you i i'll have a very short answer yes i'm assured that one of the top priorities of the european union it is to increase the relations with uh, with asia we have a strategy uh, which will be adopted about the interconnectivity with asia with central asia and it will be one of our top priorities from the point of view of the of the european union now uh, the departure of uh, uk and brexit as i said uh, during our discussions some countries like romania which is unfortunately we are in the middle we are not a big country a big member of the european union or a small member of the european union we are in the middle of the road with 20 million more okay more or less that's why our possibilities are not fantastic in the in the european union but even a country like us is ready to increase our contribution mm -hmm. to the european union provided will continue to be capable to finance the classic as i said the policies and also the new issues like migration defense, defense european defense uh, uh, cyber defense uh, and others but for the time being this idea of increasing the contributions to the european union is not accepted by let's say by western european uh, union members um, they feel there is a strong pressure if you look at the elections uh, which were uh, taking place in the last period of time you will see that there is a certain amount of uh, euro skepticism uh, in skepticism in uh, in some countries there are some parties with a populistic uh, approach and they managed they made the good results in in the elections and that's why i don't know if we'll be capable to arrive at a common conclusion to increase a little bit uh, the contribution to the european union there is another possibility to increase the share of the value added tax we are which every state is uh, is getting from uh, from the trade uh, there are there are some attempts we had some discussions with italy it's a country very close to our vision about what should be done and we'll try to find some solutions but i can't be i'm very honest i i can't give you a, a direct answer for the uh, for the trade uh, war with china i'm afraid it will be for a certain period of of time it will take place what is important is not to transform this war trade into a real war in in the region that's why i think the 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 decision of president trump to have a meeting with kim jong un and trying to find a solution is one of the possibilities to detensioning the situation in uh, in 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 asia i came here to to delhi uh, yesterday or the day before the yesterday the day before yesterday the day before yesterday coming from seoul and uh, i had a long discussion with the officials the prime minister and the foreign minister about the the importance of their direct dialogue between south korea and and north korea 
I'm confident that some things could be done, and I have the impression that the the, the authorities in uh, in in South Korea will do their best in order to find a, a solution. And I also have the impression that um, Kim Jong Un, at least that's what they said to me, is trying to be more interested in. Um, in stopping the military expenses uh, to a certain extent and trying to bring some a little comfort for the population there. He would like to be a person who is changing completely the politics uh, from the dynasty as, as it was. That's why I, I'm quite optimistic about uh, the possibility of uh, having a, a kind of solution between the North and South Korea, at least to not to have a peace treaty, but to have a declaration of uh, ending the war, because the war in Korea is still continuing. Uh, something, uh, cease, uh, there is a ceasefire, but there is no really anything about the, uh, the kind of stopping the uh, the war. And for, um, uh, for China, I, I said before, yes, their main objective is to ensure the uh, security of maritime lanes, but they are also combining it uh, with a Silk Road on the land through the Central Asia and continuing to, uh, to, to Europe. Now, globalization and multilateralism. I don't say it's, it's a panacea. I mean, it's, it's a solution for... Uh, for, for our prosperity. The truth is that globalization brought a prosperity without precedent at the level of, of our society. But this prosperity is not shared equally mm -hmm. between all countries. You have a group of countries which are con constituting a kind of nucleus, and they are taking the most advantages of it. You have a second line of countries which are looking at the nucleus and they would like to get inside. <laughs> and there are others who are outside the globalization. I mean, they have nothing to do with globalization. The same is true not only for countries, but, but also for the people from different countries. You go to the United States, maybe the most successful economic country, and you see people live, sleeping in, in, the, in the metro subways and, and others. That's why we should not consider that globalization is something which is solving all the problems. On the contrary, some problems are solved, the prosperity is increasing, but we still have a lot of problems with countries which are outside and with the population which is outside. What is missing from my point of view in this process of globalization is the fact that uh, it is an economic uh, phenomenon. It's not guided by any rules, any political rules. Banks, companies, they are doing their best. They are all, everywhere in the world and they are doing whatever they can to, to get more, more, more profit. Okay, what we really need is to increase or to create, maybe it's too much to say, to speak about it, uh, to try to increase the power of the United Nations or any other organization and to have some rules about the globalization and multilateralism in, in, in our world. We need rules and we need instruments to really impose the rules by all uh, countries. Without this, will continue to live between the prosperity, the hope for prosperity, and trying to cope with the difficulties we are confronted with at the level of countries or at, at the level of, of certain citizens. This is how I, how I see it. But all in all, I have to recognize that globalization managed to create some fantastic, uh, some fantastic um, uh, prosperity in, 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 the, in the world. Great, sir. Uh, it's very difficult to capture such a rich conversation. I think we covered literally uh, every political poser of our times. We missed to uh, say something about Vatican. Uh, and about Bollywood. So we missed all Vatican and Bollywood. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we covered everything else. Uh, but let me just say that, uh, uh, ma'am, we are closing now. Yes, I'm sorry, I should have seen you earlier. My apologies. But you'll have a chance outside to ask the question. Uh, I don't want to live to the adage of Indians not adhering to time, so I want to close on time. Uh, I just want to share two thoughts with you, sir. That the first, of course, is that um, in many ways, when you 
described the ambitions of Romania as being the hub of digital innovation, connectivity, energy, and, and other solutions for the region and beyond, it mirrored, I think, the ambitions of India as well. I mean, I, we see ourselves precisely as the provider of solutions for a world which seeks new development pathways, as a provider of solutions for the world that is embracing the knowledge age. Uh, we see ourselves as a bridge which is connecting ideologies, the North and South and the East and West. We are see ourselves as a democracy that can talk to dictators uh, and talk to other liberal societies. Uh, and I see in that sense uh, a degree of convergence of ambitions going ahead, uh, it being the bridge in multiple mm -hmm. ways for the regions we reside in, for the world generally. And as India's uh, GDP uh, doubles over the next seven years, as it increasingly becomes engaged in Central Asia, Central Europe, and beyond, I think there is a natural partnership that will have to be forged for the benefits of both our peoples. And in that sense, I could sense both an optimism in your speech for our relationship and also a wisdom and cautiousness in terms of the opportunities and challenges that we need to uh, navigate. But for your, um, uh, for your remark on uh, Pakistan being a solution for Afghanistan, I would agree with everything in your speech. I think Pakistan and Afghanistan is the problem. But we hope that on, the, on 2611, Pakistan and its new political regime sees better sense and changes track. Uh, but everything else in your speech was something that I believe uh, all of us would agree with wholeheartedly. Uh, as an institution, uh, I think we have, uh, for the last three years, been trying to start something in Romania. I have been talking to Oana and a bunch of other people, and we uh, have been trying to create a Black Sea India uh, forum where we can speak to a clutch of uh, um, social scientists, investors, technologists. And I hope that in 2019, uh, ORF will, uh, will bring a delegation to Romania and begin the process that we've been plotting over the next uh, last two or three years and the ambassador has been extremely supportive and helpful, but I hope this happens. Uh, I can thank you, I just must thank you again for coming here, giving us an opportunity to host you, and for your fantastic speech, and for engaging with everyone who was present here. Thank you very thank much, you. sir. Please join me in applauding this Thank you. Thank you. I also want to present to you a small memento uh, from ORF. And of course, we produce uh, research, this will give you an insight on what we do as a random report. Looks fantastic, very well. Uh, Thank you, sir. Very good permission I will try to offer you. Uh, oh, beautiful. A small beautiful. lithography. This is the, the palace. historical headquarters of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs I've of seen Romania. Yeah. It was demolished. Yeah, <laughs> I've seen this. I, I have seen this in Oana's house. Yeah, she really? Beautiful artifact, yes. Uh -huh. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.